Yeah? So let me actually give you some examples. I guess uh, we've been talking about uh, um, infinite square well. So let me give you the, the examples with the infinite square well so that um, you have something more concrete to look at beyond, um, beyond you know, just that pictorial representation. So I guess I already have three states written out here. Let me just uh, fill in some of the gaps so that I can actually give you actual functional forms of the wave function, tell you what the um, tell you what the, the probability density should be, and then go from there. So, um, so let's see. So these are all represent a zero level for the functions that are drawn here. Um, so this would be my ground state, E1. Um, it would be E1, I'm sorry. So that's the energy E1 <laughs> for that energy level. This would be described with some wave function. Let me match the colors. Wave function, psi 1. And I'm going to draw the time independent state. So um, as a reminder, this is what it means. So this time independent stationary state, um, it's sort of what it looks like. It's uh, psi 1 of x is equal to some amplitude times sine of um, um, I guess I will explicitly write it out. So let's say this goes from x equals 0 to x equals L. Then the wavelength of this is uh, 2L. So what I write here should be um, pi x over L. Does this seem right? How do you check if this is right? The boundary. You can check the boundary. Like when you plug in x equals 0, it's at 0. When you plug in x equals L, sine of pi is 0, it's at 0. But it's not at 0 after having gone over full cycle. It's at pi is a half of a full cycle. So it's at 0 after going, having gone over half of a cycle. Yeah? Um, so this is what's called, um, I guess, uh, let me write it down. Uh, it has, comes with uh, several different names. You could uh, call this time independent solution. And I actually don't remember what your textbook calls it. <laughs> um, so let me just give you all three that I can think of right now. Time independent solution, or solution to the time independent Schrodinger equation. Uh, you could uh, call this energy eigenstate. Everyone here knows what the phrase eigenstate or eigen refers to? Uh, how many here have heard the phrase eigenvector? It comes up in linear algebra. And what it is, is it's a special solution. It's a special solution like uh, x unit vector is a special vector, y unit vector is a special vector. Let me just leave it there. Otherwise, it's just a weird uh, mixture of German and English phrase. <laughs> I'll just leave it there. Um, next year, uh, Math 3E will be a core requisite to this class, so it'll be better next year. Um, and the third term is, uh, is the stationary state. They all mean the same thing. Um, so a particular state cannot be a stationary state unless it's also an energy eigenstate. And a particular, well, I guess stationary state and time independent solution, they seem like they're saying the same thing, right? Like time independent? Because it's a stationary. And truth is, this state is not really stationary. It's like a standing wave. When you look at a standing wave, it's not like a frozen like this. The wave is oscillating up and down, right? So it, the same is true of the quantum mechanical, quote unquote, stationary state, which would be could be like analogous to standing wave. So to get the, the time dependence, um, this is a, a mathematical relationship that holds for these stationary states. For these states, you, they have a very simple time dependence. Because it's an energy eigenstate, it has a very particular energy value, let's say E, then 
the time dependence of these states can always be written in this form. The time dependence phi as a function of time will be this complex function, e to the i, and then the frequency that's associated with this energy, which is h bar omega. So I'm going to just solve it for omega. So um, e over h bar times time. This is the time dependence for all energy eigenstates. And so given this uh, um, stationary state solution, somehow if you know the, um, if you find out the energy, you should be able to once you have the wave function, then you can construct this as the fully time dependent wave function. The fully time dependent wave function is the stationary solution multiplied by this time dependence. Once again, um, for stationary state. I guess I should probably put quote, quote unquote stationary state. Yeah. So with this in the background, when we talk about this energy eigenstate, I'm going to fall into the habit of only using the time independent solution. And soon using almost exclusively time independent Schrodinger equation. Because uh, we are only going to limit ourselves to talking about energy eigenstates and uh, that will make the time dependence very simple. Like you, does everyone see why I keep calling this a simple? It might take a while to see it. So, Remember we did all these quantum mechanical waves, our eventual goal is to calculate this absolute value squared. What happens to this function that's multiplying when you do absolute value squared? Like what uh, this function multiplied to its complex conjugate? One, right? Yeah, because you are multiplying this with e to the minus the same thing. So that's, that's the sense in which we mean this is simple. We know when you take this, this will cancel it, itself out, and it's that sense in which it is a stationary. The probability the density doesn't change as a function of time. Okay, so let me uh, write down the remaining other two so that we have some examples to look at as we do some calculations actually. So E2 uh, will be almost the same function except with uh, uh, wavelength that's uh, half as short, uh, uh, half as long, um, psi to x, a times sine of uh, 2 pi x over l, and the third state would be similar, psi 3 x some amplitude si times the sine of um, not 3 pi x over L? I guess it is 3 pi x over L. 3 pi x over L. Good? All right. So what I have left uh, uh, uncalculated in the past was I didn't say anything about what this A has to be. I kind of just uh, left it there. You know, it's something oscillating. I don't know what amplitude. Amplitude is meaningless anyway. And in some sense, that is right, because when you calculate um, momentum or energy, um, this didn't do anything. Because when you're trying to calculate momentum, what you do is you, or when you're trying to calculate energy of this, what you do is you apply the energy operator, right? So if you want to, so for example, um, uh, well, you know, like I will do that later so I won't get too deep into it. Um, so, so far we've treated this A as a physically meaningless quantity. And so far that's been okay. But now that we are giving definite meaning to this, uh, psi absolute value squared, I guess not as intensity, but as Px, or probability the density.
now we have to be careful uh, what value A will be. Um, so I guess here's one way of um, making everything sound OK. We can simply say these are not, uh, these are, um, I don't know, unnormalized wave function. And now if we want to do any calculation, anything or whatever, then now we have to normalize it. If we want to do any serious calculation, which is what we'll get to when we talk about expectation value soonish. So uh, let, me show an, uh, show, let me show you a normalization calculation example. It's actually pretty simple for these. There are wave functions where it's not simple. We won't do those in this class. You'll do them in upper division physics if you, you know, take upper division quantum mechanics, which is fun. Um, so let me show you a normalization example. So um, I guess, um, uh, let me call it this way. So normalization of wave function. Actually, I think I'm beginning to see a pattern here. So let me just do it for general psi sub n, some nth wave function. Because I think what I see is this thing multiplied by n here. That's my general wave function, right? So, um, so when you are normalizing the wave function, this is the requirement you impose on the wave function. You impose that this wave function absolute value squared integrated with respect to x from um, technically to over all space. But what is the value of wave function below x equal to 0 in this example? What's the value of wave function here? Sure, all right. It's an infinite square. Well, the wave doesn't penetrate beyond that. And same thing on this end, right? So what all space is, it's going to reduce down to from x equals 0 to L. Because outside of the range, wave function is 0 anyway. And the requirement, so that's a calculation you are doing. The requirement you are imposing is that this must equal to 1. That's the normalization requirement. That's um, what we said out here, normalization requirement. It's not a difficult calculation, so let's go through. Um, let, um, yeah, so let's go through. So let me plug in what the psi of n is. It's uh, on this. So it's uh, a times um, sine of n pi x over l. The absolute value squared thing um, so sine, this is a real function. So absolute value doesn't do anything. It can be just a squared. A, um, let me keep absolute value thing with an A. Um, that was also kind of snuck into your multiple choice answer, which was not all that <laughs> clearly explained, but wasn't wrong. <laughs> um, so I'm still integrating this with respect to x from x equals 0 to L. Mm. And that's a still equal to 1. Uh, let me factor out what I can factor out. Um, this a here, it's not a function of x, right? It's just an amplitude or constant. That means I can factor out this absolute a squared. That doesn't need to live inside the integral, right? So what, um, and since I move this here, let me, uh, do I want to move it over? Uh, let's leave it here. I don't want to move too many things in place. So what it looks like is what I have to do is I have to do this calculation. Anybody here know how to do an integral of sine squared x? Uh, I'll do this quickly. If you want, you can do this on O from alpha. And if you have the pro feature, you can look at the step-by-step -step, uh, function. Um, that'll help you 
I don't know, remind you what you should know. <laughs> um, so this is the trig identity I'm going to use. The trig identity is that um, uh, sine squared theta is equal to 1 minus cosine of 2 theta, I think that's right, over 2. Wait, that doesn't sound right. Is that right? Let me just double check. Cosine of 2 theta, cosine of 2 theta is cosine squared theta minus the sine squared theta. Right? Wait, um, the double angle formula, right? Okay, um, so when you plug this in here, then you get 1 minus um, 1 minus um, cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. So you get, um, let me just write it out. 1 minus cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta over 2. Wait, wait, I did something wrong. Um, uh, let me do this in the correct order. <laughs> so let me just quickly drive it because uh, let, uh, it's easier to start out with something I'm sure about. <laughs> so what I am sure about cosine of 2 theta is equal to cosine squared theta minus a sine squared theta. And what I can do here is I can rewrite one of these two things um, in terms of the other. Uh, let me rewrite cosine squared theta. So cosine squared theta is 1 minus sine squared theta. Right? I still have minus sine squared theta. So I have 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. Good. Everyone agree that's cosine 2 theta? So uh, sine then sine squared theta, so move this over, move this over, is equal to 1 minus cosine of 2 theta divided by 2 over 2. So I guess it, I did remember it correctly. I don't know why going backward it didn't work. Yeah. But <laughs> that's the trig identity you're supposed to have memorized. Um, so this is what I'm going to use uh, to help me do this integral. This is called the power reducing formula. It helps you reduce this power so that you have something that's just linear in the trig function that everyone here should know how to integrate. So let me just copy this over here. Sine squared theta is equal to 1 minus cosine to theta over 2. And in the end, I'm actually doing more work than I need to do here. Because something's going to go to 0, and the overall result will be actually fairly simple. But I'm just you know, doing everything to make sure. Because this is now supposed to be rigorous quantum mechanics. So I want to minimize what I skipped. Um, so what this becomes is I still have absolute value of a squared and still the same integral from x equals 0 to l. But this is now rewritten into this form. So I have 1 half minus cosine of uh, 2 times all of that, 2 n pi x over l over 2. Mm. Um, integral with respect to dx is equal to what? Everyone good? So this is where I kind of want to take a shortcut. Or not shortcut, uh, I want to just to, uh, argue my way through and not really write anything down. Look at, uh, focus on this uh, one term here. Cosine of 2n pi x over l. When you integrate from x equals 0 to l, you are integrating from the, in, the argument to cosine from 0 to 2 n pi. So it's an integer multiple of uh, uh, one full cycle, right? When you integrate cosine over integer multiples of a cycle, what do you get? 0? Zero. Zero? Yes? 
yeah so this the whole thing is going to turn out to be zero when you finish the integral so instead of going through all the trouble we say all right it's zero um, we don't have to do anything with it anymore um, all right so um, then this uh, whole integral becomes very simple then just one half integrate from zero to l so this whole integral is just uh, l over two So um, this finally gives us the constraining equation for normalization. We get this, that absolute A squared is equal to, um, I'm going to move this over here, 2 over L. So, um, so technically what that means is you have a, actually a range of possible uh, well, possibilities. So let me give you a form for A that includes all those possibilities. A can be this. A can be square root of 2 over L. That needs to be there. And then it can be complex. It can be this times e to the i phi. Like if you took this, applied it here, would you get this equality? Right. So there's an infinitely pos many number of A that can work depending on this phase factor. And obviously this is uh, unnecessarily complicated. This phase factor doesn't add any physical meaning. So the convention that people take in quantum mechanics is for this stationary state. In fact, there's a theorem that proves this. For this bound state, you can always choose your coefficient in such a way that your wave function is real. So we are going to follow the convention and just choose phi equal to zero or this whole thing equal to one. Or you know what most of you would have guessed after seeing this in the first place. Uh, we are going to go with this. Yeah. But I just want you to know that the other possibilities are there. You can change the phase a little bit and when you are uh, when you form superposition of uh, different states, sometimes that matters. The relative phase does matter. Right? So this is an example of normalization. Um, it took a little bit longer because I was talking, but um, this is a fairly simple calculation. So what this means is now when we go back to these uh, wave functions, really to have a wave function that you can use to do useful calculations with, this really should be square root of 2 over L in front of every one of these here. And I guess in this particular case, the, um, the normalization factor didn't depend on the quantum number. The normalization factor here, it didn't depend on N. But I would tell you now that in general case, that's not true. Generally, it could depend on n. Um, it is the, yeah, but here in this simplest possible case, it happens not to depend on n. So, oopsie, um, I guess not have it depend on n. <laughs>